Hello comrades and welcome to another video on the Chinese Revolution area of study one. In this video we'll be looking at the period after the Long March when the Yan'an Soviet was established. So here's a great quote from Mao Zedong. Uh, he said, we communists are like seeds and the people are like the soil. Wherever we go, we must unite with the people, take root and blossom among them. So the Anand Soviet um, was the, the end point of the Long March um, and it really grew Mao's sort of cult of personality um, over a number of years from 1937 to 1945-44. Um, so let's have a look at the context of the Anand Soviet. I mean, as I've mentioned, uh, the Long March, which took place uh, from October 1934 to October 1935, um, followed this red path. To find out more about that, go back to my last video. Um, and they ended up here at the Yan'an Soviet. Now, this red, um, uh, red shape here signifies um, the area that was controlled by the communists that is known as the Yan'an Soviet. Now in this uh, picture, in this photograph, we have, um, I don't know who these two people are, but this is Zhu and Zhu Enlei, uh, and here is Mao Zedong um, at the Yan'an Soviet in 1939. So first let's have a look at some of the changes, the big changes that took place at Yan'an. Um, starting with land and tax reform. So from 1935 to 1937, surplus land was taken from landlords and redistributed to those in need, a classic uh, socialist um, policy of redistribution of land to peasants. Uh, land reform was carried out by poor peasants associations with the support, that's meant to say, not suppose, with the support of the CCP. Uh, as it was emphasized that the people themselves must turn over the established order. They, they must be the ones to um, carry out this uh, land reform. Now, after the Second United Front in 1936, which we'll discuss um, in a, our next video, I believe, um, the communists moderated their land reform policies, no longer taking land outright from land owners uh, or landlords. The reason that they did this is because they realized that they needed the support of everyone. Uh, and so um, it was only those landlords who had fled whose land would be um, redistributed or those with surplus land um, uh, would um, hand over some of their land. But uh, the communists no longer took um, land outright after um, the Second United Front. Uh, Another aspect of their tax reform now, the CCP reduced interest on loans and mortgages from 18% to 1.5%, i.e. you didn't have to pay as much back to the communists um, on your loans or mortgages. Um, and also rents were cut to no more than 25% of the harvest um, so that peasants never ran out of food like what happened under war communism in Russia. Uh, landlords who invested in local industry or who had a son in the Red Army were also given tax bonuses and all peasants were encouraged to form cooperatives to sell their produce. Um, so a very sort of communal community style um, form of governing at the Yan'an Soviet. Now, there were multiple changes in a number of areas. Let's have a look at the social, economic and political changes that took place at Yan'an. So starting with social change, women's associations were established uh, and these were there to provide support to um, particularly poor women, um, women who had been abused by their husbands. Uh, and so it was really to provide um, uh, physical and emotional support to women. Uh, nursing mothers and pregnant women were given um, additional food rations. Uh, Education was really important at Yan'an and the literacy rate rose dramatically. In the space of seven years from 1936 to 1943, the literacy rate went from 1% in 1936 to 50% by 1943. 
Uh, evening schools were established for children and adults. So um, in terms of social change, they really focused on um, better uh, rights for women and um, improving education. Uh, economic changes. So off-duty soldiers, as they had done during uh, the Long March, um, helped peasants to till the land, harvest grain, and construct irrigation channels. Um, everyone, everyone was involved in growing food or making goods for the Soviet, uh, particularly when uh, members of the Red Army were on duty. Um, it was other people within the community's job to grow their food um, for them. Uh, women's spinning cooperatives produced most of the cloth in the Soviet. Uh, most army units produced 40% of their own food, so they were very self-sufficient. Um, and one thing that was hidden from Western uh, journalists and um, visitors was that they also grew and sold opium to Japanese-occupied territories, as this um, raised funds very quickly. Um, so, I mean... I've mentioned it before, but I should mention it again. When we talk about Soviets, it's different in China to what it was in Russia. In Russia, it was more like a um, sort of political organization. In China, it was a community. Um, so that's what we mean when we mentioned the Yan'an Soviet, the community at Yan'an under communist rule. Um, so they're the social and economic changes, political changes. Um, the uh, political system at Yan'an was based on the principle of three thirds formulated by Mao. Um, and that is that the government should be made up of one third CCP members, uh, one third from other, other leftist groups, and one third from anyone who wanted to, except for Japanese collaborators, landlords, or right wing uh, GMD members. Um, so that was trying to, and, and that was all organized uh, using uh, democratic centralism, um, similar to what we saw in China and sim similar to what we saw um, in uh, under um, Jiang Jiexia's and, and Sun Yixian's uh, leadership. Um, so uh, there was also a hierarchy of regional, district, and village councils, and these were popularly elected, uh, again, with a um, democratic centralist model. Um, Mao also formulated the theory of mass line, which is basically a principle of leadership that the communists should learn from the masses and develop policies to address their needs, um, with the quote, from the people, to the people. Now, I want to find one more quote um, about uh, Mao's theory of mass line um, because uh, it's quite relevant. So according to Mao, good revolutionary leaders should take the ideas of the masses and concentrate them, then go to the masses, persevere in the ideas and carry them through so as to form correct ideas of leadership such as the basic method of leadership. So basically his idea of what a good revolutionary leader was, was someone who listened to the masses and didn't uh, instill their views on the masses. Now, this brings us to Mao's rectification campaign. Um, and I've broken it up into two sections, purges and struggles and Mao Zedong thought. Um, now, this doesn't go into that much detail about um, purges that took place, but um, it just gives a brief overview. So in the 1940s, Mao spent up to 14 hours a day reviewing policies and studying Marxism, um, trying to um, refine his own philosophy uh, and his own um, political views um, and wishing to prove himself as a political theorist, as well as just a studier of Marx. Um, on the 1st of February 1942, Mao launched his rectification campaign to teach his own ideas to Chinese communists and eliminate the influence of his political opponents. His rectification campaign followed a, um, followed a, a, a routine. First of all, Mao or one of his allies would give a lecture to a mass gathering. Secondly, the audience would break into small groups for study and discussion of the ideas presented. 
Thirdly, those seen as unreliable faced denunciation meetings where they were denounced. Um, these were referred to as struggle sessions. Um, they were required to offer self-criticisms and also respond to criticisms from their peers. Now, those who didn't do a um, good enough job with this uh, self-criticism and um, didn't show that they were learning, um, they were uh, victims of Mao's purges. Um, this was followed by an intense study of Mao's writings. The Maoist ideal of continuous revolution demanded that communists needed to continuously renew their revolutionary energy. And that's seen in Mao's uh, routine of the rectification campaign with constant study, constant refining of their views and revisiting their um, ideology. Um, Critical and independent-minded comrades were placed under pressure to conform, and uh, one such individual was the feminist writer Ding Ling, who was very active in the new culture movement back in the 1910s. Um, Mao believed that the communists, the Chinese communists needed to be unified and united in their ideology. The campaign set successfully removed Mao's opponents from further influence in the party leadership, uh, as if they didn't um, conform to Mao's views, then they were, um, first of all, put under pressure to conform, and if not, then they were um, uh, either arrested or executed. So the second part of Mao's rectification campaign, and this is a key knowledge point in the study design, is Mao Zedong thought. Basically what that means is Mao Zedong's ideology. So Mao held a number of virtues, um, including struggle, sacrifice, selflessness, diligence, ingenuity, and courage. Now, these are all things that we saw in the Long March, uh, and that's sort of part of where his ideology um, originated and his, the virtues that he valued. Um, and these were all celebrated as the Yan'an way. Uh, Mao believed that theory and practice went hand in hand, and he had no respect for champions of so-called book learning or those who strictly followed orthodox Marxism. Um, he believed that they needed to uh, scrutinize Marxism and um, uh, construct a Marxism that works for the context of China. Um, Mao's ideology, um, which he developed, uh, which its full name is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, but we can just uh, refer to it as Mao Zedong thought. Um, this became part of the collective consciousness of the Chinese Communist Party at Yan'an, and it provided a cohesive vision and unity of purpose. Now, Mao uh, was allied with the head of the CCP propaganda bureau, Chen Boda. Um, Chen, while he was not a very good speaker and never delivered speeches um, due to uh, he had an accent and also... Um, uh, he had quite a severe stammer. Um, even though he wasn't a great speaker, he was a brilliant writer. And so he helped Mao refine his essays. And he also rewrote party history to emphasize the importance of Mao Zedong. Um, so this, again, helped to spread Mao's ideas through um, propaganda and um, through uh, editing Mao's writing. Now, by the time the rectification campaign ended in 1944, the leadership cult and political dominance of Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, was well and truly established. He was the leader of the CCP without any question or any uh, opposition. Um, the US translator Sidney Rittenberg, um, recalling his time at the Yan'an Soviet, is quoted as saying, when I was with Zhu and Lai, I felt I was with a real friend, a comrade. With Mao, I felt I was sitting next to history. With Zhou, I felt warmth. With Mao, awe. So that just shows the sort of cult of personality that Mao um, had uh, established for himself. Uh, this last slide is looking at the growth of the CCP during the years of the Yan'an Soviet. So by 1940, over 50 million people lived in the Yan'an Soviet under communist rule. 
Uh, it was governed efficiently, it was free of corruption, and it brought many benefits to its people. This is completely counter to um, what was happening with the Nanjing government under Jiang Jiexia's leadership, um, where there was lots of corruption, it wasn't governed very efficiently, and there weren't that many benefits to um, working class and peasants, to, to, to the proletariat and peasants. Um, now, let's just think about this for a moment. 50 million people lived in the Yan'an Soviet under communist rule. Now, when uh, the Long March ended in 1935, it was only seven or 8,000 uh, communists who had uh, successfully completed the Long March out of 100,000. And by the time other communists joined, joined them in Yan'an, uh, there were only 30,000 of them. Now, this is to do with... Uh, people living in Yan'an, but we can see next how Communist Party membership and, Red Ar and the Red Army grew exponentially. And you can see that in this chart as well. So in 1937, the uh, Communist Party had 40,000 members. By 1940, it had grown to 800,000 members. In 1945, there were over 1 million members. And by 1949, in those last four years, it had grown to 4.5 million CCP members. Similarly, the Red Army grew from 92,000 soldiers in 1937, five to 500,000 soldiers in 1940, then 860,000 soldiers in 1945, and uh, went all the way up to 4 million soldiers in 1949. So, if we think about the fact that 1949 is when the People's Republic of China, the PRC, was established with Mao as its leader, we can start to see why with the rapid growth of the Red Army. Now, the vast majority of support for the CCP and Red Army came from the peasantry, which was in line with Mao's view that the peasantry were the key revolutionary class. Now, as we know, this goes against Marxist theory, a traditional orthodox Marxist theory, which claims that um, it is the industrial workers, the proletariat, um, who will overthrow their capitalist overlords, um, whereas Mao believed that the peasants were the driving force of the revolution. Um, Mao also attracted uh, many intellectuals and uh, many Chinese patriots when he wrote his 1940 work on new democracy, as this embraced all social classes and uh, made a, a great emphasis on needing to have a united front against Japan. Because remember, this is at a time when Japan had invaded uh, China, and this was during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, so they had a, uh, there was a common enemy um, for the communists as well as everyday um, Chinese people. So I hope you found this video on the Yan'an Soviet um, useful and interesting. Um, in our next video, uh, we'll look a little bit more at the Second Sino-Japanese War. Um, but until next time, I'll see you later.